grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us worship God as we join together in our call to worship. Those who trust in God are like a mountain. Like a mighty range of mountains, the Lord surrounds us and protects us now and forever. May God's peace be with us today and always. Our opening hymn is number 138, Holy, Holy, Holy. of God's amazing love is this, that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we can dare to approach God with confidence. So aware of God's great love and mercy toward us, let us come before God as we confess our sin, first silently and then together. Let us pray. And together we pray, loving God, you are the source of all wisdom. As we look to you, teach us and show us what is right. In your mercy, Forgive us for our sin. By your Spirit, lead us not only to think about making changes in our lives, but cause us to act. In the name of our merciful Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Together, let us affirm our faith by saying together the Apostles' Creed. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from, him from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Oh. 
Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to see everyone with us this morning, and we're honored to have Reverend Dr. Ed Bowen filling our pulpit this morning. If I could turn your attention to the back of the bulletin for the announcements. We'd like to thank the Margaret Peak Memorial Handbell Choir for giving us such beautiful music this morning. Thank you. PW will be meeting later this week, and we have a listing of upcoming events and pulpit supply. Are there any other announcements? Yes. The music department at Mingo Central is collecting cans. So if any of you have cans that you'd like to bring in for the music department. The music department at Mingo Central is collecting cans. If anyone would like to contribute to the cause. And this week at uh, Wednesday at 5.30, PW meets, followed by bell choir practice at 7. We need more ringers. <laughs> I have a letter I'd like to read to everyone from Reverend Bob Newman. He's a professor of religion emeritus at the University of Charleston. Dear Deborah, please express to your session my thanks for all of your hospitality on last Sunday, August 16th, 2015. I was so honored and excited by your invitation to be your guest preacher and to share leadership during your morning worship service. Thanks to you and everyone for your excellent planning and preparation which made this experience of worship strong and deep for me and for everyone else. Please express to your session my thanks and appreciation for the kind and generous honorarium. I do appreciate your thoughtfulness very much. Ron and Carol Bucklew were so thoughtful to suggest that we travel together and they also enjoyed the experience of your hospitality very much and your warm welcome and caring attention really made the trip a day that was very special for us. Finally, thanks for retrieving my blue jacket. Sorry to forget to ask for it as we left. My short-term memory loss catches up with me sometimes, and you are so kind to watch after me. I'm so impressed by the spirit, vitality, and warm welcome you and your congregation display. Please let all of the rest of us in Presbytery know how we may help you in any way when we can do so. Very sincerely yours, Bob Newman. At this point in our service, we share joys and concerns with one another. Do we have joys to celebrate this morning? Okay. Okay. Are there any others? Then let's sing happy birthday to Jessica and Susie. We have joys to celebrate. All the guests. Very full weekend. Yes. Very eventful. I had a hard time finding a parking spot this morning, and that's a happy problem. <laughs> it's good to see so many old friends and to meet some new ones. <laughs> Do we have any concerns to share with one another this morning?
mother in law, Patsy. Rhonda Mango and Mark Fisher. If there are no others, let us remember these requests throughout the worship service and the week ahead. One more announcement that I neglected to tell you. If you would like a copy of this morning's service to take with you or to be mailed at a later date, Michael Perry has put a sign-up sheet in the narthex. Please just put your name and address and we'll get you a copy. And now we will sing for our next hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, on page 420 in your hymnal. Our first reading from the Bible this day is found in the New Testament in the letter of James, the second chapter, beginning with the verse numbered one. Let us listen for the word of God. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, 
Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. And our second reading this day is found in the Gospel of Mark in the 14th chapter, beginning with the verse numbered one. Let us continue to listen for God's word. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, As he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. (coughs) But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? (coughs) She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, What she has done will be told 
in remembrance of her. This ends our readings. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A few years ago, some men got together and they decided that what they most liked to do in life what they were most dedicated to in life was drinking beer. And so, for those who share their beliefs, they founded the Beer Church, which today has more than 40,000 members in 26 countries around the world. And if you're dedicated enough to the beer church, they'll even ordain you as a minister. And you don't even have to go to seminary. All you have to do is send them $15. Maybe I shouldn't have told you that. By this time next week, some of you will probably be archbishops in the beer church. Just kidding, I hope. <laughs> but the thing is that whether you think the beer church is a good idea or not, you have to give them credit for at least one thing. You have to give them credit for being very clear about what their purpose is. You have to give them credit for being really clear about what their mission is. But what about us? In the church, are we clear about what our purpose is? Are we clear about what our mission is? For many Christians, we think of the events of Holy Week as being central to our understanding of who Jesus is and in turn, key to our understanding of who we are as Jesus' followers. I think that most of us would agree that those events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion and his eventual resurrection are central to our understanding of the story of Jesus. But if we were to go up to people and ask them to name for us the important things that happened during Holy Week, what kinds of responses would we get? I imagine some people would point to the events of Palm Sunday as being important. That day when Jesus triumphantly rode into the capital city of Jerusalem on a donkey as the crowds celebrated. Others, though, perhaps would point to the events of that Thursday night as being important. That evening when Jesus had his last supper with the disciples and then went out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Or still others might point to the events of that Friday as being important when the Roman soldiers took Jesus and nailed him to the cross. If you were to ask people to name for you the important things that happened during the Holy Week, those are the kinds of responses that you would likely hear. But what's missing from that list? What's missing is that story that we heard here just now from the Gospel of Mark. On one of the evenings of Holy Week, probably on the Tuesday night of that week, Jesus was invited to have dinner at the home of a man by the name of Simon. 
And we're told that Simon was a leper. The way the story is told, it's not entirely clear whether Simon still had leprosy or whether he had been cured of that affliction. But in either case, it's quite possible that not too many people accepted invitations to have dinner at Simon's house for fear that if you ate his food or or touched his napkins or, or, or shook hands with him, that you might end up coming down with that dread disease yourself. But Jesus accepted Simon's invitation, and that night was there at Simon's table along with his disciples. Well, at some point during the meal, a woman came into the room. We aren't told who she was. We aren't told what her name was. But she took a bottle of very expensive perfume and began to pour it onto Jesus' head. Well, right away, the disciples and many of the guests there began to scold that woman. They criticized her for wasting the perfume in that way. But Jesus stood up for that woman. And so he scolded the disciples and the other guests. And in fact, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Wherever the good news is proclaimed in all the world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Nowhere else in all the Gospels does Jesus ever say anything like that again. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in all the world, what she has done, will be told in remembrance of her. But why, we might wonder, did Jesus say that? What was so important, uh, so special about what she did? Well, Jesus tells us. What was so special, so important, was this. In that moment, in that situation, With what she had at her disposal, she did what she could to show her love for Jesus. In contrast, how do the other major Holy Week figures stack up? The disciple named Judas could have decided to remain faithful to Jesus, but instead he decided to accept a bribe of 30 silver coins in order to betray Jesus. The disciple named Peter could have publicly affirmed his commitment to Jesus even after Jesus had been arrested. But instead, Peter denied even knowing who Jesus was. Not just one time, but three times. And the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, could have put that whole trial to an end because he knew that Jesus was not guilty of anything deserving death. But instead, he decided to give in to the crowd and allow an innocent man to be killed. A favorite hymn of many people is, What a friend we have in Jesus. But what kind of friend does Jesus have in us? That is why Jesus praised that unnamed woman so very highly. In that moment, in that situation, With what she had at her disposal, she did what she could to show that she was Jesus' friend. She did what she could to show her love for Jesus. In Christian artwork, 
If the artist wants to show that someone is a godly or saintly sort of person, what does the artist do? The artist draws a halo around the person's head. And usually halos are round, the symbol of perfection. But recently I learned that not all halos are round. Instead, in the past, if a saintly or, or godly sort of person was included in a piece of artwork while they were still alive, they were given a square halo, such as is found in the picture of the mosaic that you find printed in the insert of today's bulletin. You'll notice there that the three figures on the right part of the mosaic are all given round halos. But the person on the left is given a square halo, meaning that that person was still alive at the time when that mosaic was originally constructed. But why a square halo? I believe that it's a way of saying that during this earthly life, none of us fully reaches perfection. We all still have our rough edges. But those imperfections and rough edges don't prevent us from doing what we can to show our love for Jesus. After all, that woman who poured the perfume on Jesus' head was praised by Jesus so very highly, not because she was sinless or perfect. No, Jesus praised her because in that moment, in that situation, with what she had at her disposal, she did what she could to show her love for Jesus. Just like here in West Virginia, high school football is also a big deal down in Texas. And in the community of Grapevine, Texas, many of the people there root for one of the local teams, the Faith Christian School Lions. On the football field, the, the Lions are a tremendous force with 70 players, 12 coaches, all the latest uniforms and training equipment, and dozens and dozens of very involved parents. Well, a couple of years ago, the Faith Christian School Lions were going into their game against the Gainesville State Tornadoes undefeated with a record of 8-0. and oh. But on the other side of the field, the Tornadoes had not won a game all year. Their record was 0-8 oh and, and in fact had only scored two touchdowns the whole year. As the tornadoes walked onto the field, they had only 14 players. Their uniforms and pads were old and worn out. And they were escorted onto the field by 12 security guards who proceeded to unlock their handcuffs. You see, Gainesville State is a maximum security prison for youth located just outside of Dallas. But before that game, the Faith Lions coach came up with an idea. He said, what if for one night, half of our fans sat on the other side of the stadium and cheered for the tornadoes? Here is the message that I want to send to those kids. You are just as important as any other person on the face of the planet. 
And so when the tornadoes came out of the locker room before the game, they were stunned to see a banner being held for them to crash through that said, Go Tornadoes. And sitting on their side of the stadium were hundreds of fans cheering and rooting for them by name, being led by real cheerleaders. At the end of the game, even though Gainesville State lost 33-14, to 14, their players practically danced off the field. After both of the teams had changed out of their uniforms, they met at the center of the field for a prayer. And one of the boys from Gainesville State <coughs> asked if he could say the prayer. Well, at first his coach hesitated because he wasn't really sure what the young man might say. But eventually he told him to go ahead. And so that young man, a boy by the name of Isaiah, prayed, Lord, I don't know how this happened. And so I don't know how to thank you. But before tonight, I never would have known that there are so many people in this world who care about us. As the guards led the tornadoes back to their bus, the faith Christian fans handed each of the players a, a, a paper bag filled with hamburgers and french fries and candy bars and a Bible and letters of encouragement written by the faith players. Before he got on the bus, the tornado's coach took the faith lion's coach aside and said to him, Your people will never know what you did for these kids here tonight. You'll never, ever know. There, in that moment, in that situation, there at that Friday night football game, those faith Christian fans showed their love for Jesus by showing love to those kids. So often, when it comes to living out our Christian faith, we focus on what we can't do. We focus on what we can't do because we don't have the money or we don't have the talent or we don't have the skill. But Jesus invites us to consider what it is that we can do. In each moment, in each situation, with whatever you have at your disposal, do what you can to show your love for Jesus. Let us pray. Faithful and holy Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be your people, to be your servants in the world. Open our eyes and hearts each day so that we might come to a greater awareness of how we might be able to take what we have and use it to be a blessing to those around us. In the name of of Jesus we pray. Amen. And let us continue with our pastoral prayer as we respond. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. For you are the creator and maker of us all. You have formed each one of us in your own image, and by the gift of your Spirit, you have granted us the gift of life. 
especially on this Labor Day weekend, oh God, we thank you for the opportunities you place in our lives to serve you by using the gifts and the talents that you have endowed us with to use them for the benefit and the good of those in need in the world around us. Eternal God, this day we lift our prayers for your people around the world. And especially we lift our prayers for Christians in other lands and in this land who are facing persecution because of their faith. Help us to learn from their example. And, O oh God, uphold them in their times of trial so that they might be your faithful witnesses to those who are around them. We pray this day for those who face hunger in their lives, for those who are homeless, and for all who feel overwhelmed by the burdens of this life. Draw near to us, O oh God, and give to us the help and the hope that we seek. We pray, dear God, for this congregation and for this community. We give thanks for the many ways that your spirit as it is at work in our midst. And we rejoice in the many, many people who have returned here to Gil Gilbert to celebrate the ties and the bonds that they have formed across the years. Merciful Lord, we raise our prayers for all who this day are sick, for those who are homebound, for those who are facing times of medical treatment. Help us to always remember that you, O oh God, are the great physician and the source of all healing. And we pray as well for ourselves. You know, O oh God, the troubles, the, the cares, the worries that so often fill our days. Be near to us and grant us the peace and healing that we desire. For we offer all our prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his people to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as we prepare to offer our gifts to God, let us join in the opening response. What shall we give to the Lord for all his generous gifts?
Let us pray. Faithful Lord, all that we are and all that we have is a gift from your hand. Help us each day, guided by your Holy Spirit, to use those treasures and blessings in wise and generous ways. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And our closing hymn this day is number 388, O Jesus, I Have Promised. Go now in peace and serve the Lord with gladness. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.